Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Zhang. I'm a member of the Borg team at Google. Borg is a software component that is responsible for managing all hardware resources at the cluster level. In the first half of my career at Google, I mostly worked on CPU memory resource management. With the advancement of machine learning, I transitioned my interest to more machine learning related to hardware resource management. Today, I'm going to present automated GP sharing at a scale. This is a joint work with my colleague, Jia Fan Zhu at Google. Now, first motivations, why we choose to do this project. As we all know, GPUs are very expensive hardware. One single unit of NVIDIA GPU can easily cost tens of thousand dollars on the market. With the recent advancement of machine learning, such as ChatGPT or BART, the severe competition in the space further fuels the demand of GPU. Here is a third-party research about the graphic unit market size from 2022 to 2032. Today, we are at a market size of about 50 billion US dollars. As in the next seven to eight years, this market is going to more than 500 billion dollars. With this rapid growth and the market size, even a small percentage of efficiency improvements can translate to millions of millions of dollars saving. And we believe GP sharing is one of many potential solutions to improve the efficiency. With that, here is the agenda of my talk. First, I will introduce some basics about the GPU hardware. Then I will talk about how we automate the GPU sharing at Google. I will share some deployment experience and the evaluation result. Lastly, I will conclude with some key takeaways. OK, first, let's talk about the basics of the GPU hardware. There are two major hardware components on a GPU. The first one is compute units. It provides massive parison for matrix operations. It's equivalent to the CPU cores on a traditional server. The other component is on-chip memory. It is also known as high bandwidth memory. I will refer to it as HBM in the rest of this talk. This is equivalent to the DRAM on a traditional server platform. For GPU sharing, the limited HBM capacity is a bottleneck resource, as it has limited capacity but needs to be shared by co-running GPU tasks. On the older GPU, like a V100 and P100, the HBM is only 16 gigabytes. On a newer platform like A100 or H100, you may have about 80 gigabytes of memory or even bigger. When the HBM capacity is exhausted, it will trigger an off-memory error. And when that error is triggered, it's better. Most likely, the task will fail and crash. Luckily, there's a solution to that. This is called unified memory. Essentially, it creates a virtual memory space that maps both the HBM and the host DRAM. So when the HBM is exhausted, there's no more room, but the page will be swapped from HBM to host DRAM. Because usually the host DRAM is 10x or even more bigger than the HBM. So virtually you will not see the OM anymore, but you have to pay the overhead of slowdown because memory paging, memory swapping between the two takes time. And for GPU sharing, it does not work for all workloads, but it, luckily we have a certain of workloads that can benefit from it. The targeted workloads for GPU sharing is a single GPU workload. It could be some researchers trying some research ideas just to validate the model's convergency without a full scale of experiments. And it also could be some production prototype with small data sets and to validate all the configurations without a full blown flash. Typically for the single GPU workloads, it's less sensitive for sharing. And also has a very lightweight touch on the usage, occasionally with some spikes. Here's a table to show the computer usage and HPM usage for single GPU workloads that I was running our fleet. On the main, it has 23% of computer usage and 34% of HPM capacity usage. As you can see, this provides an upside for sharing opportunities. On the 90 percentile, the compute usage is about 68%, and the HPM usage is about 86%. Again, this sort of confirms that the HPM usage is the first bottleneck in terms of resource sharing. 
We also tried multi-GPU workloads, but found out that it's very sensitive for noisy neighbor. And if you have a one replica in the multi-GPU workloads that suffers from GPU sharing, this quickly becomes a straggler in the overall workload and might have a cascading side effect. Because as we all know, the machine learning training, especially training, is mostly running in synchronized fashion. And one straggler can slow down the whole pipeline. As for hardware mechanism, there are two basic ways for sharing. The first one we refer as a static resource partition. So in this case, both the computing units and the HBM are statically partitioned among co-running tasks. An example of this mechanism is called NVIDIA's multi-instance GPU, MIG. This type of mechanism provides best resource isolation because everything is physically partitioned, but somehow it limits the sharing upsides. Take the MIG for example. If you have a two task sharing, MIG can only equally partition the HM space among the two tasks, regardless of their individual resource consumption requirement. Even if you have a dynamic partition mechanism available, you still need a prior knowledge to know the individual task resource consumption, then find out the optimal partition point. The second hardware mechanism for sharing we refer as a dynamic resource sharing. So in this case, the computer units are 10 multiplexed in round robot fashion. This is very similar to the context switch that happens in the Linux kernel. As for the HM capacity, this will be shared dynamically among tasks. So we find out that this will give us better overall performance because all the resources, especially the HPM, can benefit from the resource pooling effect. And this can be, give, I can give example on both the spatial and temporal perspective. By spatial, imagine you have a one small task that co-run with a bigger task. So now both of them can maximize the HPM capacity utilization without performance penalty. That's what I refer as a spatial benefit. But temporal benefit, now imagine you have a two tasks, both with a, both has a very high peak usage. But as long as you do not simultaneously speak, there's still opportunity for them to co-run together and share the device in a harmony fashion without a reverse performance penalty. So that is what I refer as a temporal benefit. Of course, dynamic resource sharing will give us our best overall performance, but it also has less guarantee on performance isolation, which we'll address in a software way later. Next, I'm going to talk about how we automate the GPU sharing in our fleet. The prerequisite for GPU sharing is that we enable unified memory for tasks that participate in GPU sharing, such that the OOM will never happen to them. The automation process has four major components, and I will describe them one by one in great details. The first step is extensive real-time telemetry collection. We collect application-level metrics, such as steps per second. This is a typical throughput metric for machine learning training workloads. We also collect hardware counters, for example, computer utilization, memory bandwidth utilization, HPM occupancy, etc. We export those telemetries continuously via real-time signals, so there's a feedback loop-driven optimization, as well as long-term database, which is used for post-analysis. The second component is to infer the baseline performance. We explore the natural idle periods during task setup, teardown, or waiting for updates. During those idle periods, we can infer the baseline performance of the other co-running tasks that's sharing GPU with the idling task. By doing so, it eliminates the need of profiling or trial runs to get a baseline performance of tasks that participate in the sharing. The third component is the runtime detection of performance anomalies. As we continuously monitor the runtime performance, we can raise a flag if the monitor performance drops to some certain threshold. And in our experience, small percentage of sharing cases are indeed categorized as performance anomalies and suffer performance loss. The last component of this automation process is called cry for help. This is a process introduced to mitigate the performance anomalies. It will reschedule tasks 
that it shows performance on normally behavior. During this rescheduling, tasks with antagonism behavior will be opted out from feature sharing. We employ a hardware heuristic to identify antagonist tasks. The task with the most heavy usage profile will be deemed as antagonist, and therefore we think it's not friendly to share with other tasks in the future. Cry for help greatly reduce the anomaly cases, as we're going to show in the later slides. GP sharing was deployed into Google's internal GP cluster in 2020. Immediately after these deployments, we observed significant utilization improvement of GPU devices. In addition to that, we also saw host DRAM and CPU utilization improvement. And this is the first time that we can overcommit GPU capacity at the cluster level. Remember, all this was done during COVID. Despite all the engineers work from home, the demand for GPU never faded away. And with the GPU sharing, this greatly improved their productivity during the industry level supply chain shortage. Here, I want to talk a little bit more about the cluster level utilization improvement. Before I jump into the details as well, I want to define some terminology used here. On the y-axis, we show the normalized number of GPUs. Here, the normalized number of GPUs is defined as the total number of GPUs requested by all the jobs, then normalized to the physical capacity of GPU in that particular cluster. So if you see the yellow line point at 1.0, that means 1% of the physical GPUs are occupied. Prior to the GPU sharing, which is indicated by the dashed red line, we have a normalized GPU around 90 to 92 percent. And there is a few percentage deducted from the 100 percent due to the holdbacks for things like repairs, updates, maintenance, stuff like that. After we deploy the GPU sharing, which is indicated by the solid blue line, the normalized GPUs is always above 1.0 which means we effectively overcommit GPU capacity. We schedule jobs more than physical capacity can hold, thanks to GPU sharing. And you can see compared to before and after, there's a 20% of delta. This means that we can schedule 20% more jobs at the cluster level. This is a great efficiency boost to our cluster utilization. I also want to talk about a little bit about the cry for help mitigation. Cry for help was introduced as a mechanism to mitigate performance anomalies. In our sharing setup, we allow up to two tasks share one physical chip, and we use 50% normalized performance as the threshold to define anomaly. Why 50% normalized performance? If you have two tasks sharing, each of them get 50% of normalized performance, then that's the two sum up to be 100%, which is the break even point for sharing. Here, the normalized performance is defined as when the task is sharing, normalized to that performance when the task is not sharing with anyone else. Before the craft hub was introduced, we saw 14% of individual tasks that participated in the sharing drops to under the 50% normalized performance. Once we have the craft hub deployed and the reschedule can automatically kick in and correct the anomaly behavior, the cases for the performance anomaly dropped from 40% to 5%. I also like to take this opportunity to share some lessons we learned through this large scale deployment. The first is two way sharing is more practical. What I mean by two way sharing? we only allow up to two tasks share one GPU device, mostly for two reasons. We found out that by putting more tasks on a machine, it naturally increased the CPU and the DRAM demand. And we find out DRAM capacity quickly become a limiting factor on how many GPU tasks you can share on a single host. Another factor for this decision is that the sharing benefit will quickly diminish as the number of corroding tasks increase. Remember, in the early slides, I showed the mean usage for both the HBM capacity and also the compute units. The more you, tasks you put on the device, 
the more demanding those tasks will become in your total. The second takeaway lesson is that multi GPU workloads are very sensitive to noisy neighbor. With the increasing demand for large language model like LLM, the, the single job may consist thousand chips, even tens of thousand chips, and they're super sensitive to the straggler, which will have a cascading effect in this synchronized training fashion. We found out they are less suitable for GPU sharing, at least with the current hardware limitation. When I talk about hardware limitation, we wish there are more hardware enhancements down the road. Most basically, we'd like to see the dynamic resource partitioning instead of static resource partitioning, and we also want to see the per-process hardware profiling. Some of the hardware counters today is profiled at the device level and cannot be easily break down by process. Lastly, but not leastly, sharing is a choice. It's not a tax imposed on the end user. Here, I want to share a story that we had when we first tried to deploy the GP sharing. We put it as a mandate and opting up all the users to the sharing. And some performance benchmark team, they cannot tolerate the noise neighbor issue and they have to opt out. So by working with the customers, we've led them to choose by themselves and provide incentives for them to adopt. For example, by adopting to this GP sharing, you may virtually double your quota and you can submit more jobs. So that naturally pro provides incentives for users that can adopt them and can tolerate the performance. We find that working with users rather than force them will give us a win-win situation. All right, I would like to conclude my talk with some key takeaways. First, GP sharing is practical and beneficial to certain class of workloads. Of course, it does not work for all workloads, but it does for certain type of workloads that can tolerate the performance penalty and it will achieve great efficiency at a large scale. The HBIM is the key resource in terms of GPU sharing, and you need to find a good way to maximize the utilization on HBM to achieve the maximum performance. Resource pooling has better overall performance than static partitioning, and the benefits come from both spatial and the temporal fashion. Lastly, we introduce a reactive cry for help to mitigate the performance anomalies. It reduces the performance anomalies from 40% to 5% in our case. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank you for your time.